Welcome to Role Playing History, the podcast where we explore the history of role playing games. I'm Wayne Davis, and I'll be your guide for today's tour. Episode 61 Flying Buffalo, Palladium Books, and FASA Corporation. Before we dive into this week's tour, I wanted to take a minute to let you know that if you haven't seen it already, I shared the trailer for the new movie Dungeons & Dragons Honor Among Thieves to the YouTube channel. When I shared it to my personal Facebook account, I commented that I'm intrigued. And that's true. Based on what I'm seeing in this one trailer, I am very interested in this movie. That being said, I also know there are those out there who are already picking the movie apart and commenting about how this thing isn't accurate and that thing isn't right. And if you spend any time on social media, you've got a pretty good idea what I'm talking about. All I'm going to say about all of it at this point is this. There are always going to be people who are looking for something to bitch about. To me, this trailer looks really good. Does this movie look like it's going to be an epic flick like Lord of the Rings? Hell no. But how many D&D parties are really like the Fellowship of the Ring? In my experience, most D&D parties are closer to Holy Grail than the One Ring. I mean, my group tends to lean more towards the fish slapping dance than the Holy Grail anyway. You can Google that or YouTube that if you're not sure what I just said. Anyway, I say all of that to say this. Let's give this movie a chance. I mean, this is one trailer, and there are some people that are losing their damn minds over one trailer. Considering the movie doesn't even come out until 2023, we're going to get at least one or two more trailers. We'll probably see some behind-the-scenes stuff. So, everybody just chill. Besides, even when we get all of that, the only way we're going to know for sure how good this movie's going to be is to get off our butts and go see it, which is exactly what I intend to do, and I hope you do as well. All right, so here endeth my soapbox shit. Without further ado, let's crank up the tour bus and get into today's tour. January of 1970 brought the company Flying Buffalo Incorporated into existence and into the gaming world. FBI, as it was known for a short period of time, came to be because of Rick Loomis, who created a play-by-mail game called Nuclear Destruction. Loomis was the moderator for multiplayer games in that format. For the record, Nuclear Destruction is considered by the majority of gaming historians as the first commercial play-by-mail game. Now, I'm not going to get into great detail today about what play-by-mail games are or or how that process works, because that's going to be next week's topic. But I think you can figure out the basics of it, even though it might, like it did with me for a bit, confuse you as to exactly how in the hell you pull that off. Like I said, we're going to dive into that next week. Getting back on subject, it didn't take long for Loomis to have picked up more than 200 players playing Nuclear Destruction in a number of different games that he was running. So, to make it easier for him to moderate the various games, Loomis enlisted a fellow soldier, Steve McGregor, to write him a computer program to help moderate the game. Now, this would be a good point to note that Loomis and McGregor were in the U.S. Army at the time. At first, they accomplished this task by running time on a computer near Fort Shafter, which for the uninitiated is in Hawaii. The name Flying Buffalo was Loomis's creation, and he came up with it because the place they were renting the computer time from needed a business name. That's it. Now let's take a minute and put everything I just said into perspective. This was 1970, 1971-ish. Computers were not as prevalent as they are now, though they weren't just for the government and colleges with a lot of money anymore. That being said, Renting computer time was a thing, but the idea of renting computer time to write a program to help you moderate your play-by-mail games, that was a way out there concept for 1971. Loomis and McGregor left the army in 1972 and almost immediately incorporated the company as Flying Buffalo Incorporated. At that same time, the two pooled their savings to purchase a Raytheon 704 microcomputer in order to keep running their play-by-mail turns. So if you're curious as to how much that cost, and I'm one of those people who need to know. Print ads at the time claimed the Raytheon 704 cost less than $10,000. However, most of the sources I've checked puts the price at $10,000, which is probably due to rounding. In 2022 dollars, Loomis and McGregor dropped 70 grand for a microcomputer to run their play-by-mail game. Ladies and gentlemen, that is called confidence in what you're doing. And they definitely made their money back, and they made it back rather quickly. How that happened will be explained in better detail in next week's episode. 
1972, the boys started publishing their own magazine, which they named Flying Buffalo Quarterly. Over the years, Flying Buffalo published a large number of play-by-mail games, and we'll get into a couple of those in a moment or two. However, the company did realize that publishing games outside of the play-by-mail concept would be a good idea, and they acquired the game Nuclear War for publishing. For the record, Nuclear War was published in 1972. As we discussed in last week's episode, Flying Buffalo made a deal with Ken St. Andre to publish the tabletop role-playing game Tunnels and Trolls beginning in 1975. After that, the company shifted its focus from creating new games to creating background materials for other fantasy role-playing games, though they continued also to publish materials for the various games in their production lines. The products they produced for other systems wound up what's being called the Catalyst series, and we'll touch on that in a future episode as well. In 1976, Flying Buffalo added a new space exploration and conquest game to their play-by-mail line called Starweb. 1978 brought Sorcerer's Apprentice into the Flying Buffalo portfolio. Sorcerer's Apprentice was a magazine focusing on fantasy role-playing games, with materials on Star Web and other space games also included. Think of it as Flying Buffalo's answer to Dragon Magazine. Also in 1978, Flying Buffalo purchased a board war game called Schutztrupp, which was created by Jim Bumpus. As the 70s became the 80s, Flying Buffalo was, pun not intended, flying high. In 1980, the company reported that it had more than 3,000 play-by-mail players worldwide. In 1983, they reported they'd reached their greatest number of employees to that time, which was 21. And for the record, 21 would be the most employees they'd ever have at one single time. Also during this period of time, Flying Buffalo ran a line of gaming stores in their name in Tempe, Arizona. The final store shut its doors in 1985. There was good news for the company in 1985. They assigned their 10,000th account number for their play-by-mail. Now, while it was true that number one belonged to Rick Loomis, number 10,000 was given to a paying customer from Athens, Alabama. Unfortunately, I was unable to find that person's name. If it happens to be you... Hit me up. I want to hear from you. As a part of their announcement of the 10,000th account number, Flying Buffalo reported that in the 14-year period up to that point, some of their play-by-mail games had been run hundreds of times each. For the record, Star Web had been run more than 870 times, Battle Plan 930 times, and 720 times for nuclear destruction. And the company announced the 50th issue of Flying Buffalo Quarterly, which, with the release of Sorcerer's Apprentice, had shifted its focus almost exclusively to the goings-on within Flying Buffalo, including articles on upcoming releases. Fast-forwarding through the Flying Buffalo timeline, in 1992, the company published Mage's Blood and Old Bones, a Tunnel and Trolls shared world anthology. As the title notes, the book is an anthology of stories told from within the Tunnels and Trolls world. Reviews for the book have been mixed over the years, though the ones I read trended more positive than not. And I'm not including any of them because they're reviews from book sites, so that means they're customers. If you want to check them out for yourself, head to Goodreads or to Amazon and check out for yourself. I should also point out that copies of this book are still available. However, I've only found them online, so use your favorite online book retailer if you're so inclined, or check with your favorite brick and mortar bookstore and see if by chance they can order you a copy. As it's been out of print for a bit, I'm going to doubt they're going to be able to, but as I'm a fan of utilizing your friendly neighborhood business, let's give them a shot first. Flying Buffalo continued to run their play-by-mail games and publish various supplements for their tabletop games as the millennium rolled over. However, in July of 2021, Webbed Sphere acquired Flying Buffalo Inc., but they assured gamers that they'd keep the company name alive and would continue to publish the various products under the banner. The exception to this was the play-by-mail line, which was not a part of the sale. Rich Loomis formed another company, Rich Loomis PBM Games, and continues to run nine of the games Flying Buffalo ran for years. Heroic Fantasy, Nuclear Destruction, and Star Web are just three of the lines that he has continued. One more note on the history of Flying Buffalo before we get into the company's various products, and this one's going to win you the pony at a trivia contest. With the dissolution of TSR in 1997, Flying Buffalo Inc. is, and remains, thanks to WebSphere leaving the name and products alive, the oldest pen and paper role-playing game publisher in the world. As of this show, they've been doing their thing for 52 years. And that's three years longer than I've been on the planet, so we're both old as hell. 
So, let's talk about some of the products Flying Buffalo has released over the years. I mentioned Tunnels and Trolls and Schutzroop, but I didn't get too deep into the play-by-mail offerings. Tell you what, I'll just list out the PBM games and we'll deep dive one of them in a minute. So there was Battle Plan, Covert Operations, Election Year, Feudal Lords, Galactic Conflict, Heroic Fantasy, Illuminati, Lizards, Mobius One, Nuclear Destruction, Nuclear War, Rift Lords, Rift Wars, Star Lord, Star Web, Worldwide Battle Plan, and 1939 Worldwide Battle Plan. Whew, that was a lot. Flying Buffalo also produced a multitude of odd dice over the years. What I mean by that is they made sets like one you could use to determine which toppings to order on your pizza. Stuff like that. Finally, Flying Buffalo holds the printing rights to two flipbook systems, Ace of Aces and Lost Worlds. Flying Buffalo games have won a number of awards in the play-by-mail world over the years, and four of their designers, Rick Loomis in 1988, Michael Stackpole in 1993, Elizabeth T. Danforth in 1995, and Ken St. Andre in 2018 were awarded the Origins Hall of Fame Award. Okay, so this isn't going to be quite as deep a dive as I just went into, but I thought we should do a bit of an examination of nuclear destruction. After all, with its creation in 1970, nuclear destruction created the commercial play-by-mail industry. It should also be noted that while the game was initially only played by mail, because... duh you could now also play it by email. For a detail on the gameplay, let's get our information from a professional. And no, that's not me. I've never played a play-by-mail game. Charles Mosteller, the editor-in-chief of Suspense and Decision, which is the modern play-by-mail magazine, gave the following explanation of the game. Quote, Nuclear destruction is a strategic missile game with emphasis on diplomacy. The object is to be the sole survivor at the end of the game by arranging for the other players to be destroyed with nuclear missiles. Players can use missiles, anti-missiles, factories, and money, which can be used to influence other players. End quote. Like I said, we'll get more into play-by-mail games next week, so we'll explain in better detail how they work. I've got one review of nuclear destruction, and it comes from Dennis Augusta in issue 9 of Command. Quote, it's intellect against intellect, where the outcome of the game is determined by how you and your allies, if you have any, make your moves. The excitement level of PBM nuclear destruction is very high, especially when the game is run on one or two week deadlines, end quote. I wanted to examine one more product in the Flying Buffalo line, specifically because it's a type of game I had actually never heard of before I did the research for this week's show. Ace of Aces, which was developed by Alfred Leonardi and published by Nova Game Designs initially, was first released in 1980. Ace of Aces is a two-player combat picture book game. So how does that work? For this game, each player has a small book. One is marked German and the other Ally. Now, instead of reading through the book, each player is at or on a particular page, and the book represents a World War I fighter plane. The illustration on the page shows the view from the plane's cockpit looking at the opponent. Also on the page are a series of maneuvers that can be used with page numbers listed below them. Next up, each player chooses a maneuver and announces the page number. Each player flips to the page number the opponent announced, looks up their own maneuver there, then turns to the page number listed under it. The process continues until one player has maneuvered the other player into their sights and can shoot them down. For the record, the game can be played by one player who basically chooses maneuvers, flips to the page number, and continues the process until they shoot down their fictional opponent. This would give a new player an opportunity to see how maneuvers work. There was also a sheet of rules included that would ramp up the game to intermediate and advanced levels and would add altitude differences, ammunition supply, wind speed, and jammed guns. A plus for this game is that you don't need a table to play it, so it can be played anywhere. Between 1980 and 1997 expansions were released for the game. It also should be noted that while the original has been out of print for quite some time, in June of 2012, a group got permission from Alfred Leonardi to launch a Kickstarter to reprint the game. It succeeded, and new copies of the game came out in January of 2014. And since I love me some reviews, let's do one. D. Aldridge reviewed the game in issue 34 of Phoenix. He did lament the high cost of the game in the UK at the time, as it was £10, which would be equal to about $63.90 in U.S. currency today. However, he seemed to like it, remarking that, quote, you do get a greater sense of involvement than you do from shoving counters around a board. The game plays quickly, can be taught to anyone in a couple of minutes in the basic version, and it does seem to impart something of the feel of World War I aerial combat, end quote. In 1999, Pyramid Magazine named Ace of Aces as one of the Millennium's best games. 
It also won the 1981 Charles S. Roberts Award at the Origins Awards for Gamer's Choice of 1980. It was also inducted into the Product Hall of Fame at the 1993 Origins Awards. The next stop on our tour is a look at Palladium Books. Palladium Books was launched by Kevin Simbieta in Detroit, Michigan in April of 1981. The first game the new company released was The Mechanoid Invasion. It sold okay, but when compared to the next release, it sold practically nothing. In 1983, the company released the first edition of the game that would help the company launch to the level of successful game publishers, the Palladium role-playing game. We're going to cover that in depth in another show, so I just want to mention it for now. Between the release of the Palladium role-playing game and the release of Heroes Unlimited in 1984, Palladium also released Valley of the Pharaohs. And I've got to note, all three of those game systems made bank for Palladium. Palladium got into the comic book movie game adaptation game in 1985 with the release of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I've got that one teed up to review after our look at Palladium, so we will get to that game in this show. Next up was the game that not only made him a lot of money, but also caused him a lot of controversy over the years, and that was the 1986 release of Robotech. It should also be noted that Palladium was one of the major distributors of Robotech merchandise for a lot of years. However, between the late 1990s and early 2000s, Palladium lost all of their licenses and chose not to pursue renewal. There is one more Robotech note I want to make in this section. In 2007, Palladium was able to successfully negotiate with Harmony Gold USA to be able to produce a role-playing game, Robotech The Shadow Chronicles role-playing game. However, that license also expired in 2018 and was not renewed. I want to back up on the timeline a bit to hit another big release from Palladium, and it's another game that players still play today. Rifts was released in 1990. That's another game we're going to give its own episode to, so I just want to leave it there for now. I know I'm doing a lot of that in that show, and I apologize for that, but if I did everything here, I wouldn't have stuff for shows later on. Just stick with me. Over the years, Palladium has claimed on more than one occasion that it was the first publisher in the role-playing game industry to adopt the practice of perfect binding its books, which has since been picked up and used by pretty much every other company. Now, I have to admit, I had no idea what the hell perfect binding meant, so I looked it up. According to FormaxPrinting.com, perfect binding is a process by which the pages and cover are glued together at the spine with a strong yet flexible thermal glue. The other three sides of the book are then trimmed as needed to give them a clean or perfect edge. Now, I can't prove or disprove Palladium's claim, but if you check out the games at your friendly local neighborhood game store, you'll see a number of selections that use that same method to this day. So if Palladium happened to be the first, that was a winning idea. Oh, and what's the advantage of perfect printing? Glad you asked. It allows publishers to publish a soft cover book that is of a better quality than paperback books, which means they'll be less expensive than hardcover books, which seem to still be the majority of books on the market, especially if you're playing D&D. Just saying. Over the years, Palladium has also made money licensing their intellectual properties to third-party developers. Even the king of their mountain, Rifts, has been licensed out, but only one book has ever been published through a license. In December of 1994, Mirabedin Press released Rifts Manhunter. However, Palladium yanked the license in May of 96. October of 2000 saw Rifts licensed to Precedence Entertainment for a collectible card game. If you're curious how well that went, Precedence Entertainment is no longer in business. In May of 2004, Rifts was licensed to produce Rifts Promise of Power, which was a video game for the Nokia N-Gage gaming platform. Wait, you don't remember the Nokia N-Gage? You're not the only one. It died quicker than a red shirt on an away mission in Star Trek. Trust me. In May of 2003, Palladium announced that Walt Disney Pictures and Jerry Bruckheimer Films optioned Rifts for a film. On April 19th, 2006, it was announced that, quote, until Jerry Bruckheimer has a script he loves, the movie can't get the green light, end quote. Kevin Simbietta announced on April 11th, 2011, that the film option would be extended for another year, which would be the ninth year at that time. And at this point, I think it's pretty safe to say that movie's not coming. All right, with history covered, let's get into the juicy stuff. Criticisms and controversies. Oh, come on. Don't tell me you don't like some juicy controversies in your podcast from time to time. I've seen your playlist. No, I haven't. I've seen my playlist. And I like juicy stuff. So anyway, here we go. On April 19th, 2006, Simbietta issued a statement that revealed Palladium Books was having some serious financial issues. 
The statement alleged there was embezzlement and theft that had caused losses somewhere between $850,000 and $1.3 million U.S. On top of that, the deals for the Nokia Engage, the Bruckheimer movie, a massively multiplayer online game license, and a number of other deals were also causing financial problems. Needless to say, Palladium needed money and they needed it quickly. To raise cash, the company decided to sell a signed and numbered art print painted by Kevin Simbietta. Note for the record, I didn't say limited edition. That's because it was never promoted as one. The company basically printed as many of them as they had orders for. One other move they made to try to raise money was that they strongly encouraged their customers to buy their product directly from the online store. Needless to say, that move pissed off a whole lot of gamers and store owners, if we're going to be really honest here. So how did the embezzlement deal turn out? According to an article in the April 26, 2006 edition of the Kingsport Times News, Steve Shearing, who had been Palladium's sales manager at one time, took a plea bargain to a misdemeanor charge, which gave him one year's probation and an order to repay $47,080 to Palladium Books as restitution for his thefts. The article also noted that the thefts had taken place between 2002 and 2004 and were only noticed when Palladium finally took inventory. And I am dead serious about that last sentence. I wish I was done bashing Palladium books, but uh, I'm not. There's more stuff out there, so let's hit on some more of it. In the interest of historical accuracy, of course. The one thing that needs to be understood is that Kevin Simbietta is the sole owner of Palladium books and therefore has absolute control of the company. Writers who've had their works published by the company over the years have accused Ciambietta of not delegating responsibilities, a lack of open dialogue with his employees, and bad interpersonal relationships. Needless to say, most of the writers who voiced their opinions were no longer working for or writing for the company, so obviously make of that what you will. One writer later apologized for the way he made his statements, but he would not retract them. Robotech RPG Tactics was another issue for Palladium that turned into a complete shit show. And yes, I deliberately chose shit show instead of goat rope. Here's why. In 2013, Palladium launched a Kickstarter to produce Robotech RPG Tactics. Needless to say, the campaign was a success as it raised about $1.5 million from about 5,400 backers. That's about the only good news I'm going to have on this subject. When the campaign launched, Palladium announced the release date for the 2013 holiday season. Shortly before that release time, it was shifted to the spring or summer of 2014. Not too long after that, the release was shifted again to the summer or autumn of 2014. And that was for domestic backers. International backers wouldn't get their product until well after that. Palladium Books claimed the shifting dates were due to a number of unforeseen issues and specifically blamed the Chinese New Year for causing the production to start later than they'd expected. Now, I'm going to be shifting back and forth across the timeline at this point, so just stay with me. On September 8th, 2014, several of the Kickstarter backers reported they'd gotten their copies of the game. However, Palladium reported that most of the rewards from the campaign were awaiting cargo delivery from China. The company reported in update number 156 that there were six cargo ships with backer rewards on them and officially moved the reward availability date to October of 2014. However, Palladium had pulled a controversial move in July of 2014. On July 14th, Palladium Books basically begged the Kickstarter backers to allow them to sell any available copies of Robotech RBG Tactics at Gen Con 2014. If you've ever been a part of a Kickstarter, you see the issue here. For those of you who haven't, pretty much every Kickstarter for a game product promises backers they're going to get their games and the rewards before anybody in the general public gets access to them. The update posted to Kickstarter at the time written by Ciambietta, stated that it would, quote, be disastrous to not have the small selection of items I've listed available for sale. Not having them will hurt the launch of Robotech RPG Tactics and Palladium Books. That small selection, by the way, was six items. The main box game, four of the expansion packs, and the rule book. In other words, the most important stuff backers of the campaign were wanting. Ciambietta umped the ante by stating, quote, anyone who does not respond by July 21st, end quote, will be considered to be a yes. Needless to say, the poll didn't matter to Palladium at the end of the day because they made plans to sell the product anyway. For the record, the poll was never released, but later investigations into it, primarily by writers polling those who were a part of the campaign, showed that the result was an overwhelming no. But just days before Gen Con, here we go. 
Palladium received word that the shipping containers that had the game in it had been tagged for inspection by U.S. Customs, which meant they couldn't take them to Gen Con to sell. As of the end of March 2015, none of the international backers of the game had gotten their backer rewards, and Palladium had stopped giving reports on potential dates. Again, though, Palladium was talking out of both sides of their mouths, as numerous box sets of the game had been seen in game shops outside of the U.S., by mid-April of 2015, international backers reported that they'd started getting some of their product. Now, I could continue a point-by-point -point report of this, but needless to say, Palladium continued to move shipping dates, backers continued to not get their product, and those who did get them complained that what they got wasn't what they'd been promised. In fact, one person did an unboxing video and noted that none of the miniatures had been painted, which wasn't supposed to be the case, and noted that a lot of the paper materials needed for the game were missing, and there were a number of other issues with the materials that were actually there. Palladium's response was to shift blame to the various companies that produced the products, and while while they did offer PDF versions of the missing or damaged paper products, they were a low-res PDF, so the backers didn't get the level of quality they paid for. So, with that in mind, several backers threatened to file a complaint with the Michigan Attorney General, and according to several sources, they actually did. And at least 14 backers filed complaints against Palladium with the Better Business Bureau. As of February of 2016, only 176 out of more than 5,000 backers had received all of their backer awards, and that was more than 1,000 days after the project ended. For the record, 1,000 days is way longer than it should take for total fulfillment. And I can use our friends at Awfully Queer Heroes as an example, as they got their PDFs out really quick, and I can assure you they're going to have their hard copy books out within a couple of months of the drop date of this show. In other words, they're going to have fulfilled their Kickstarter in about a quarter of the time of this debacle, and they will make sure their backers get everything they backed come hell or high water. And I can say that with confidence, because that's happened in every other Kickstarter Awfully Queer Heroes heroes has ever done. Okay, I'm still not done on the Palladium subject. On February 27th, 2018, Kevin Sambietta announced that the company would no longer be able to fulfill the Wave 2 rewards and, because of the loss of the Robotech license, they wouldn't even try to produce or support Robotech RPG tactics after March 31st, 2018. Sambietta announced that the cost of producing Wave 1 items was $1.5 million, which meant they couldn't produce Wave 2 items. In an attempt to somewhat pacify their backers, Palladium offered a rewards swap process. However, the valuation of the swap favored Palladium heavily. It also required that any backer doing the swap had to pay the shipping to their location in advance, as well as renounce any legal claims against Palladium. Needless to say, this only increased the spotlight and pressure on Palladium, with the new charge from backers being that funds had been misused. The company attempted to squash that by releasing a pie chart showing where the money went. There was one problem with that. It was missing certain bits of information that might be considered pertinent. The percentage of tax paid, the percentage of funds received as a part of the backer kit in 2013, and, you know, other important details. There were a number of backers who requested cash refunds as part of the terms of services signed by Palladium Books at the start of the campaign. However, as of this recording, we have no idea whether or not the money was refunded, and CMBETA has steadfastly refused to answer questions about either the refunds or how the money was used. There are some inside the gaming industry that believe that Harmony Gold's unwillingness to renew the Robotech license can be almost directly tied to the Kickstarter campaign. However, Harmony Gold has also refused to comment on that theory, so as of now, that's all it is. A theory. Wow. Okay, so I was just going to go through the various products in the line here, but after that, I think we're better off just moving along. So let's take a look at Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Other Strangeness, which was a game published by Palladium from September of 1985 through January of 2000. The game was based on the comic book that was created by Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird, and the game was designed by Eric Wolchick. It should be noted that the game came out before the franchise hit huge, so Palladium was ahead of the curve on this one. The book also had original comics and illustrations from Eastman and Laird, which to me would make it a collector's item. The base system for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was the Megaversal system, which we'll discuss in greater detail when we cover Heroes Unlimited. While the comic had mutated turtles and a rat, the game had a large list of animals that the players could be, as well as a multiple of ways the character could be mutated. In addition, some animals allowed for different varieties, such as dog breeds, and the game provided rules to create new animals. As in the comics, the mutant character lives in the modern time on the fringes of society and lives by a certain code. 
Most gamers would think of this as alignment, but the game uses phrases like miscreant or would never accept stolen property as ways to define how the character would behave. The game originally mirrored the universe of the comics, but as time went on, the adventures were completely independent of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and introduced brand new characters. In January of 1986, the game spawned an alternate game setting called After the Bomb. It took place in a post-apocalyptic Earth populated primarily with mutant animals and residual humans. I like that term, residual humans. <laughs> it quickly developed into a separate system, though it was still compatible with the original. Kevin Ciambietta reported that the 1987 television cartoon and live-action movie damaged the game because it changed the universe of the Turtles and therefore hurt the popularity of the game. He reported that, because of the show in the movie, sales of the game dropped from 50000 per year to 12000 then to 6000 I have a theory of my own on this, and I'll explain it in a minute. Palladium announced that a second version of the game would be released in the fall of 1997. However, the cost of maintaining the license, as well as low pre-orders, killed it. Instead, Palladium decided to end the license in 2000, though Ciambietta hinted in a February 2007 interview that the company might relicense the property. Needless to say, that development hasn't taken place as of this show. Okay, so here's my thought on why the sales numbers for the game dropped. The original version of the game had a section detailing various mental illnesses that appear to have been taken almost directly from the DSM at the time. It allowed players to select a form of mental illness either during character creation or during the course of the game. It should be noted that sexual deviances were also in there, because they're in the DSM, and that turned off a lot of younger gamers, and parents as well. I'm sure. Palladium's response to that was initially to just cover the sexual deviancy section with a white sticker. Then they removed it completely from subsequent printings. However, since references to them were still in other sections of the book, they were really never gone. So in the mid 1980s, you've got a game based on a comic book with a section about mental illness and sexual deviancy. Yeah, I don't think it was the cartoon show and movie that did the game in, and I think you could figure out why. Plus, we know from our previous discussion of Palladium that Kevin Ciambietta likes to alter the narrative, so without him releasing true figures, all we have is his word. Anyway, that's my theory, and I could be wrong. Between 1986 and 1990, there were five supplements released for the game. As we do, let's check out a review. Marcus L. Rowland reviewed the game in White Dwarf 79. He said that, quote, The comics pretend to take themselves very seriously. To reflect this, the style of play is completely deadpan, setting intelligent and deadly animals against a background of urban terrorism, gang warfare, juvenile delinquency, and random violence." End quote. In the 1996 Arcane poll for the 50 most popular role-playing games of all time, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was 36. Paul Pettengale stated that, quote, "...the rules are badly laid out, but the principles are easy to learn, and combat is fluid." So, fine on that score. It's a superbly fun game to play because of its quirkiness and the fact that the post-apocalyptic setting has most of California under the ocean. Fantastic fun. End quote. Okay, last up on our tour today is FASA Corporation. FASA was founded by Jordan Wiseman and L. Ross Babcock III in 1980. Weissman and Babcock were friends and gamers at the United States Merchant Marine Academy. For the record, Weissman and Babcock started the company with $350, which would be about $1,200 today. The first products that came from FASA were for Traveler, which were supplements they produced through a license with Game Designers Workshop. In 1982, they staked their claim as a top role-playing game company by releasing Star Trek The Role-Playing Game, which we detailed in a previous episode of this show. In 1985, Jordan's father, Mort, joined the company to lead the company's operational management, as he'd just sold his own book publishing company. Mort shifted the company's focus into diversification, and FASA got into publishing books and miniatures. Battletech is a line of miniatures many gamers might recognize. The line was initially released in 1984 as Battle Droids, but got the name change in 1985. Interestingly enough, FASA wound up licensing the production of the figures to miniature figurines in a cost-cutting move. This move came after consulting with their UK distributor at the time, which was Chart Hobby Distributors. The company released the Doctor Who role-playing game in 1985, and yeah, we covered that in a previous show as well. Mech Warrior came out in 1986, Shadowrun in 1989, we covered that one, plus several other role-playing, board, and miniature games. At some point during this run of success, FASA acquired the U.S. miniature company Rall Partha, who just happened to be the U.S. manufacturer for miniature figures. As time went on, Mork focused on the paper and metal side of the business, while Jordan and Ross focused on the development of computer games. 
They were particularly focused on virtual reality games, but also worked on desktop games. In the late 1990s, Microsoft acquired Fossa Interactive, which was the Jordan and Ross side of the business. At that point, Ross left the company and went with Microsoft. On April 30th, 2001, Fossa stopped all operations. However, it wasn't because of money trouble, which is kind of a new one for us. The owners decided they wanted to get out while they were doing well financially, especially considering they felt the market overall was beginning a downhill slide. Additionally, Mort Wiseman wanted to retire, so rather than divide the company amongst themselves in some sort of equitable manner, the business was just closed. Now, that being said, FASA still exists as a corporation because it maintains all of its intellectual property rights. Those are licensed to other companies for production. When the company closed, Battletech and Shadowrun were sold to WizKids. The license for Earthdawn was sold to WizKids, but FASA wound up getting that back not too long afterwards. And on June 14th, 2012, Jordan Wiseman and L. Ross Babcock formed FASA Games Incorporated, which doesn't own any of the license held by FASA. Instead, they determined to create new games for release. However, their first release was a fourth edition of Earthdawn, which they licensed from FASA, Though I have to imagine they got a pretty sweetheart deal on that. They did produce a new game in 2016. Titled 1879, it's a steampunk style game set in Victorian England. Which sounds like a game I need to pick up and test for the campaign build along. Or if you've played it, hit me up and give me your opinion. Either way, with that, we've come to the end of today's tour. Next week, as I said earlier in this episode, we're going to check out the play-by-mail system of gaming. I've never done it, but it's had a long and successful history, so it deserves its place in this podcast. Speaking of podcasts, I'd appreciate it if you checked out my other show, Bad GM's Campaign Build-Along. We build a complete campaign for you from beginning to end, and since I run it for my home group, you get feedback on what we've created. Bad GM's Campaign Build-Along is available wherever you get your podcasts. The music we use on this show comes from Pixabay.com. Hit them up for all your license-free, royalty-free music needs for your next project. Role-Playing History is a production of Bad GM Productions. Follow us on Facebook at Facebook.com forward slash Bad GM Productions. Twitter at Bad GMP. YouTube, we've got our own channel, Bad GM Productions. You can also email us at Bad GM Productions at gmail.com. Oh, and if you catch the show on the Role Playing History YouTube channel, we are going to stop posting that site beginning August 15th. So to keep getting your new stuff, please subscribe to the Bad GM Productions YouTube channel. All right, so next week, it's play by mail games. No need for a stamp. But that's next week. Until then, I'm Wayne Davis, and you're Role Playing History.